Welcome to this lecture about Reconstruction. This was a political reform movement and an important one that began during the Civil War and extended for about 15 years afterwards. There are a few themes to be addressed in this presentation. First, we'll profile different individuals, two presidents and also some members of Congress. We'll explore their goals and accomplishments of these individuals. And then we'll show how Reconstruction came to an end, as well as some of its accomplishments. What you want to do is to keep in the back of your mind is an evaluation of this reform movement. Do you believe it to be a success or failure? We should probably start with the definition. A good one sentence definition of Reconstruction would be, this was the process of putting the nation back together after the Civil War. This slide helps to provide a visual aid identifying the devastation associated with the Civil War. Without a doubt, it was the deadliest war in American history. Now you may be saying to yourself, the Civil War took place over 150 years ago, yet the impact of the war is actually much sooner or more recent than you would think. For example, in January of 2021, yes, January of 2021, Helen Jackson, who is believed to be the last Civil War widow, died. She actually met veteran James Brolin in the 1930s when she was 17 and he was 93. She was a caretaker of sorts for him. Eventually, he convinced her to marry him because he wanted her to receive his Civil War pension. The two were married in a private ceremony. She never told anyone and the two were never intimate. And she was actually embarrassed about the whole story until 2017 and she had a conversation with her pastor. So. Here's an example of the Civil War impacting us just recently, but the story doesn't end there. The image here shows Gertrude Janeway. She was another Civil War widow. She died in 2003 at the age of 93. She met and then married her husband when she was 18 years old, and he was 81. She received her widow's pension of $70 a month for the rest of her life following her husband's death. They were only married for three years, and she was asked by friends, well, um, what was it like being married to a man who was 81? And she said, we sparked for three years. The two never had any children. And Gertie, as her friends called her, never remarried. But again, the story doesn't end here either. On the right, we see an image of Alberta Martin. She was a widow, a young widow in 1927 when she met William Martin. She was raising her son after her husband had died in a car accident. He was 81 and she was 21. And he was a veteran with a $50 a month pension. The two struck up a conversation and then a friendship and they were married. They actually had one child, a son. Well, Mr. Martin died after a few years of marriage in 1931. Shortly thereafter, Alberta remarried. Who did she marry? William's grandson. Yes, the truth can be stranger than fiction. Uh, this really did happen. Uh, you can't write this stuff, so history really can be pretty exciting and there's quite a story to be told in many cases. So let's begin by discussing presidential reconstruction by focusing on the goal or the plan offered by Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's goal throughout the Civil War as well as with reconstruction was to try to reunify the nation as quickly as possible. Therefore, he devised a plan 
often referred to as the 10% plan, which would make it very easy for the Confederate states to return to the Union. Lincoln's plan for reconstruction was announced during the war in 1863, and it had a few important provisions. First of all, it called for 10% of the voters in the Confederate states to agree to two items. First of all, they had to accept emancipation, and secondly, they had to swear loyalty to the Union. Critics of Lincoln said that this was far too lenient. But there was another provision as well. If a person had been a high-ranking Confederate official in the government or in the military, they lost their ability to vote unless they received a pardon from the president. Lincoln recognized that the states of the Confederacy didn't go anywhere. Instead, they had simply rejected the United States Constitution. He wanted to bring them back into the family as quickly and easily as possible. The states identified here in yellow, as well as kind of the orange or rust color, were the states of the, the, the Confederacy. As far as Lincoln was concerned, once these conditions were met, then the states of the Confederacy could return to the Union. He wanted to bring an end to the fighting as quickly as possible. While Lincoln's plan never became law because members of Congress disagreed with its leniency, it's an important item to note because this was Lincoln's goal. Supporters of a lenient peace toward the Confederacy had their hopes dashed when Abraham Lincoln attended a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. During the performance, veteran actor John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln at point-blank range. He then jumped from the presidential booth and left the performance, and he was able to escape the area as quickly as possible, not with a getaway car, but on a getaway horse. I was lucky enough a few years ago to visit Ford's Theater in the DC area, and you can go inside the theater and see the location of where Abraham Lincoln was shot, and you can walk among the different seats in the theater itself. After Lincoln was shot, he was brought across the street to the building in the middle where the arrow is pointing, and that's where he died. On the right, we see the actual chair that Lincoln was sitting in when he was shot, and it's actually located here in Michigan at the Henry Ford Museum. John Wilkes Booth was later tracked down by authorities, and he refused to surrender, and he received a fatal wound and died. Several other individuals were targeted as well, as they helped Booth as they conspired to kill Lincoln. On the right, we see the hanging of several of those cons uh, involved in the conspiracy, including the first woman who was executed by the United States government, named Mary Sherratt. Now, there are lots of conspiracy theories about the Abraham Lincoln assassination. I actually found one when I was at the grocery checkout a few years back. It turns out that this theory claimed that Lincoln was actually a woman and John Wilkes Booth was a jilted lover. Apparently, Abe was actually a babe. Not so sure about that theory, though. Next, I'd like to explore what happened with Reconstruction following the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I'd like to explore the actions and the goals of three key individuals who played a role in Reconstruction following Lincoln's murder. They include Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, who were both radical Republicans, as well as Andrew Johnson. First, I'd like to identify what's meant by the phrase radical Republicans. As one would suspect, these were members of the Republican Party, but they had two primary goals. First, they wanted to punish the South for causing the Civil War. Secondly, they fought desperately to try to protect the rights of former slaves. <laughs> 
Thaddeus Stevens was one radical Republican. He was the leading radical Republican in the House of Representatives. His goal was to focus on economic opportunity for former slaves. Some people associated this goal with the idea of offering African Americans 40 acres and a mule, a plot of land, and an animal to work the land. Thaddeus Stevens was so committed to racial equality that upon his death, he was buried in a cemetery for African Americans. Even cemeteries were segregated in this era. A second radical Republican is shown here. His name was Charles Sumner. Sumner was the leading radical Republican in the United States Senate. In the years prior to the Civil War, Sumner was a member of the Senate, and he was a staunch opponent of slavery. At one point, he was attacked on the floor of the U.S. Senate by a member of the House of Representatives named Preston Brooks. This uh, image here uh, is a political cartoon uh, depicting that conflict. Rather than focusing his actions on economic opportunity for African Americans, Sumner tried to focus on citizenship and political rights for former slaves. We'll see some examples of his accomplishments in a little while. The third key individual is shown here. This is Andrew Johnson. He assumed the presidency following Lincoln's assassination. Prior to the Civil War, he was a member of the Senate and he was named Lincoln's vice president. Uh, Lincoln tried to bring the country together by having a Democrat join his administration. And um, Johnson's plan for reconstruction was very similar to Lincoln's. The state circled on this map is Tennessee. Uh, Johnson was from the state of Tennessee, and prior to the Civil War, he had been a member of the Senate. He was the only Southern senator to remain loyal to the Union, which was why Lincoln tapped him to be his vice president in an attempt to bring unity to the country, um, even though Johnson was a Democrat and Lincoln was a Republican. Uh, Johnson had very much of a failed presidency. See, his plan was similar to Abraham Lincoln's. When many of those Confederate officers and politicians asked him for a pardon, he began issuing pardon after pardon after pardon and issued some 13,000 pardons to people that many in the North considered to be traitors. He also was unconcerned with the rights of former slaves. Now, Johnson was opposed to slavery, but he did not believe in racial equality. And when many states began to pass black codes, Johnson did nothing about them. Uh, on the right, we see an image of a Texas black code. Uh, what these did was they were a series of laws passed in local communities that established conditions very similar to slavery for black Americans. For example, African Americans had to have an employer. They also were prohibited from leaving their plantations. They could, there were restrictions placed upon racial intermarriage. Blacks were prohibited from serving on juries and had um, many other prohibitions on their actions or behaviors. So Johnson took no steps to protect the rights of African Americans with the, when those black codes were passed. Johnson also was opposed to an organization called the Freedmen's Bureau. This was designed to provide relief for former slaves. Among other things, they helped to establish schools for African American children. Prior to the Civil War, it was illegal to teach slaves to read and write. Well, the Freedmen's Bureau established schools in many of the states of the former Confederacy in hopes of teaching adults as well as young people to read and write. This was a huge bonus for African American families. Another goal of this government agency was to help reunite many families that had been separated uh, as some family members might have been sold to a different plantation in the years prior to the Civil War. Well, Johnson 
vetoed the renewal of the Freedmen's Bureau, and this put him at odds with many members of Congress, those radical Republicans. As a result of the policies followed by President Johnson and the conflict that he had with members of Congress, he was the first president to be impeached in 1868. The image on the left shows a political cartoon from this era, identifying Andrew Johnson as King Andrew I. Now, sometimes people are a little bit confused as to what's meant by the term impeachment. Impeachment does not mean removal from office. Instead, there's a two-step process if you want to remove the president from office. The first step is impeachment. This means that official charges have been brought against the president, basically saying, we think that you might have violated the Constitution in some way. This is undertaken by a majority vote in the House of Representatives. Once the president has been officially charged with this, then there would be a trial. The trial takes place in the Senate. Each individual senator acts as a jury. In order to remove the president, a two-thirds majority vote is needed. In the case of Andrew Johnson, he was impeached by the House. Then he had a trial in the Senate. However, there were not enough votes to remove him from office. So Andrew Johnson was impeached, but he was not removed from office because there weren't enough votes. Now, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but I thought I should also point out that we've had two other presidents in American history who've been impeached, Bill Clinton, as well as Donald Trump. Johnson, Clinton, and Trump were each impeached. They were impeached all the way. However, at the end of their trials in the Senate, in every single case, or each of these three cases, there were not enough votes to remove them from office. So Johnson, Clinton, and Trump were impeached, but none was removed. Although Andrew Johnson remained in the White House after his impeachment, he really lost all political relevance and influence. As a result, Congress then took over uh, for Reconstruction following his impeachment in 1868. Next, I'd like to explore the second phase of Reconstruction. This would be radical or congressional Reconstruction, where members of Congress, mainly those radical Republicans, were able to drive policy. So, following Johnson's impeachment, Congress controlled Reconstruction, and they passed a series of legislation often referred to as the Reconstruction Acts. There are a few main points to these acts. First of all, all of those former states of the Confederacy were militarily occupied by American troops. So five military districts were created and martial law was put into place in those states of the former Confederacy. The people did not have the right to vote for their elected officials. Instead, the US military was in charge. That military occupation of the South could only come to an end once, once the residents of those states ratified the 14th Amendment. Because these amendments are important, I want to talk about all three of the so-called Civil War Amendments, the most important being the 14th Amendment. The 13th Amendment is the first of these Civil War Amendments. Basically, in two words, it prohibited slavery. On the right, you see the text of this amendment. Some researchers have described the 14th Amendment as the single most important amendment outside of the Bill of Rights. It had three main areas of focus. First of all, it helped to define citizenship in the United States and declared all persons born in the United States are citizens of the US. Secondly, what did that citizenship give you? Well, citizens are guaranteed equal treatment under the law. Third, 
if a state denied adult males the right to vote, well, they had some of their power and authority taken away and they were punished. Now, the 14th Amendment was supposed to ensure that African-American men would have the right to vote, but in order to make sure that this was clear and clarified, Congress passed the 15th Amendment as well, and this eventually was ratified by 1870. This guaranteed the right of all African-American men to vote. Those Civil War amendments were a tremendous success. Just think about this. Prior to the Civil War, African Americans were considered to be property of their owners. Not only did the 14th Amendment guarantee citizenship, African American men had the right to vote. Slavery would be no more. However, there were limits to what Congress and the nation was willing to do at the time. That 40 acres and a mule that I talked about, that never happened. There was no redistribution of land. And African Americans overwhelmingly lived as sharecroppers on the land and really faced very little opportunity for economic advancement. Next, I'd like to explore a presidential election and bring an end to this era of Reconstruction. There were two major candidates who ran for the presidency in 1876. The Democrat was Samuel Tilden. He was from New York and he was a political reformer trying to eliminate corruption in politics. The second was a Republican. This was Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, he was the former governor of Ohio. And the winner was um, unclear. This was an incredibly close election. So there were some problems with this election of 1876. Um, what was clear was that Tilden, the Democrat, did win the popular vote at 51% to Hayes's 48%. But the results from three states, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, were disputed. The Democrats claimed that they won and that the Republicans cheated. And the Republicans claimed that they won, and the Democrats cheated. Uh, in order to win the presidency, one, at the time, one needed to secure 185 electoral votes. This dispute had to be settled by Congress. The 2020 presidential election was also described as disputed. There were several claims of election fraud uh, brought by President Trump and many of his supporters. However, the situation was different as compared to 1876. In 2020, each state certified the election results, even after several courts were involved, as well as recounts in numerous states by Democratic as well as Republican officials. Furthermore, national security officials described the election as, quote, the most secure in American history. In January of 2021, following a speech by President Trump, numerous supporters stormed the United States Capitol. And you can see some of the images of this on the left. The last time this had been done was the War of 1812. Well, in 1876, to address the dispute from 150 or so years ago, Congress sought a compromise. Congress established an electoral commission that met at the Wormley Hotel in Washington, D.C. The commissioners included seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and an independent. But that independent saw the writing on the wall and, and resigned his position. Eventually, he was replaced by a Republican. That commission ended up developing a compromise solution to the, to the disputed election. Those commissioners developed what has come to be known as the Compromise of 1877. This was put into place in order to avoid another civil war. The compromise involved this. First of all, Hayes, the Republican, was named president. This made people in the North happy. Secondly, that military occupation of the South 
Well, that ended. This made Southern whites happy. Here's that electoral map once again, and you can see that those disputed electoral votes were assigned to Rutherford B. Hayes. So he won the presidency with 185 electoral votes. I was lucky enough a few years ago to visit Fremont, Ohio, the home of Rutherford B. Hayes. There's a nice museum there, and it's a good place to stop, stretch your legs, and, and learn a little history if you find yourself in that part of Ohio. So that crisis was averted by Congress when the Compromise of 1877 was adopted. But it also left behind some big unfinished business. Once those U.S. troops left the South, the rights of the slaves, former slaves, were no longer protected. Basically what happened is that whites in the North turned their backs on former slaves and said, well, um, you're going to have to fend for yourselves now and the rights of former slaves were no longer protected. I'd like to conclude this lecture with some final thoughts concerning Reconstruction. Throughout the course of this presentation, I tried to identify key individuals, their goals and their accomplishments associated with Reconstruction. You'll want to be able to identify these, also to explain how Reconstruction came to an end, and also to evaluate Reconstruction. Scholars actually have a mixed interpretation of Reconstruction. Some argue that Reconstruction was a success. It was successful because the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments guaranteed the end of slavery, guaranteed equal treatment under the law, and the right of African American men to vote. Others declare Reconstruction was a failure because after those U.S. troops left the South in 1877, those rights were only in place on paper, not in reality. It wasn't until the 1950s and the 1960s and the Civil Rights Movement that we see many of those rights actually taking place, although some would argue that inequalities still exist today. So you want to be able to offer your own opinion. Do you believe Reconstruction was an overall success or a failure? Well, that's it for today. I hope you learned something new. Take care. Have a great day, and I'll see you online.